All right, so I'm going to assume that just about everyone in this room spends far too much time in front of a keyboard. I'm also going to assume that most people in this room have very strong opinions about computer keyboards and on the merits of remapping your caps lock key to control, as God intended. So if you don't do this, we're going to take you out back and beat you with a Model M. Our next speaker is an electrical engineering student and founder of Atom, Compu Atom Computer, where he designed one of the nicest split ergonomic staggered columnar R RGB backlit mechanical keyboards out there. Woo! So please welcome to the stage, Ariane Nazami. Yes. Thank you. Hey there. So uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, hope you guys have had a pretty good day at Hackaday so far. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right into it. So this is going to be a talk. More? Closer? OK, cool. So this is going to be a talk um, that ultimately ends up with how to build your own mechanical keyboard. But before we get there, um, we're going to have a little bit of fun. And we're going to talk about the history of the mechanical keyboard a little bit, and also um, what mechanical keyboards look like today and what you can do with them. Um, so first off, let's start with the history of the mechanical keyboard. And unfortunately, for time purposes, this is extremely abridged. Um, so in the beginning, um, there was the teletype machine. And shortly after that, there was the electric typewriter, which IBM kind of pioneered with their Selectric models. Um, these were the first electromechanical keyboards that existed, um, and this is kind of what set the tone for everything that followed. Um, shortly after this, in the 1970s, um, there were, or and this was actually 1950s, sorry, um, there was the Univac computer. Univac was this big, you know, building size computer, and it was the first one that was commercially sold that actually came with a mechanical keyboard instead of either punch cards or switches or all the other types of uh, input methods at the time. So that was pretty revolutionary. Um, after that, once uh, home computers started to become a little bit more uh, commonplace, we started to get the Altairs and the M size, and a few of you probably remember these. And you'll note, you'll remember that they didn't actually come with keyboards uh, built in or any sort of procedure for that. They, uh, you had to make your own. And so these are a couple of examples of teletype and actually more specifically electric typewriter keyboards that were retrofitted to run on these machines, which is actually pretty cool. Um, after that, around 1977, the personal computer really started to take off. And this kind of happened uh, with what a lot of people consider the trinity of the original personal computers. There was the Commodore PET, there was the Apple II, and the TRS-80, the Radio Shack Tandy TRS-80. And the reason why these computers are so iconic and the reason why they sold so well is because they were some of the first computers that actually came with keyboards built in and actually had the software necessary to run them out of the box. Um, so on that note, we're going to talk about a couple notable computer keyboards from history. And that's a little bit of what's on here. So the very first computer here, and i um, going to tribute a little bit to Apple's uh, sense of flair. This guy is, ta-da, a Macintosh Plus. It's actually a 512K front with a Plus mod. So um, there's another guy, Sprite, doing a presentation about miniaturizing this tomorrow. So we got the real thing, which is even cooler. Um, and I'm going to have it talk a little bit about its own keyboard. So let's see if I can do this too. Yeah, it's too quiet. Darn. Well, anyway, um, it has a speech function. It's really cool. Anyway, so what it's trying to tell you is it came with a Alps XKCC, SKCC cream linear switches. Um, but the reason why it's important is because it was the first consumer model keyboard that shipped with a companion mouse, which is really important. Uh, the next computer down the line is the Compact Portable Plus. And if you don't know why this computer is really important, it was the first IBM compatible, fully IBM compatible, well, 95%. And it is what started the PC revolution. Not personal computer, but IBM PC. Its keyboard is a very interesting combination mechanical capacitive uh, hybrid sort of thing. And the reason why it's great and the reason why it sucks is because each one of these things is a little piece of foam in the middle, uh, in the bottom of it that triggers a, uh, a little capacitive layer. And each one of those things degrades over time and I had to replace every single one of those. Um, so that thing kind of sucks. But the computer's amazing. Um, up next, Commodore 64. Most of people know about this. It's actually not a real mechanical keyboard. Uh, it is also another hybrid, but it is hybrid mechanical rubber dome. So this keyboard, or computer, if you don't know, was the highest selling computer single model of all time. So now we get to the interesting one, the IBM Model M. 
Most people swear this is the best computer or keyboard ever made. Um, I disagree with that. Um, but I, I respect your opinions. Um, but the reason why it's important is because it is a buckling spring type keyboard. And for those of you that don't know, that's basically a fancy word for saying most people don't make that kind anymore. Um, it is a really cool one, has a very interesting click. I don't know if I can click that up. Anyway, um, point is, <laughs> eh, <Yeah>. sure. <laughs> Yeah, uh, some people swear by it because there's no keyboard today that does feel like this. I'll give them that. But I like blues better, so deal with it. Um, all right, so let's move on because we've got a lot to cover. Um, now we're going to get to modern mechanical keyboards. So this is kind of the lineup of what you'd see in a typical 1980s um, you know, computer market. But today, it's much, much simpler. There's basically only one type of switch nowadays. We've got Cherry MX switches, right? Um, and for, the, for those of you that don't know, basically the way this works is the color of the key tells you a lot about the feel of the key and not much else. So for example, Cherry MX Reds are all linear, and you can tell because if you see, the plunger basically has a little nib on it, and that's just flat. And when it comes down, that metal contact just slides right into its second metal contact and completes the circuit. Browns are very, very similar to Reds, except that they have a little, uh, I guess like a valley, you could call it. And that creates a tactile bump, but doesn't create very much sound. So most people tend to go with the Browns because they're the least uh, how do I put this, uh, invasive? Um, but for those of us that don't care, there's the Cherry MX Blue. And in my opinion, this is a really great key because it's kind of like the brown where you do have that valley, but it's got this really amazing collar that also shoots down and hits the bottom of the keyboard, makes this really nice clicking sound. That's, the, that's what you're hearing. Um, and in my opinion, browns feel like mush, but you know, this is all personal preference. So if you know what color of key you like, that tells you um, kind of what what, what sort of feel you like. Um, so here's the thing though, I said Cherry MX, right? But some of us know that not all the keyboards out there actually use Cherry switches, so what's the deal? Well, basically what people decided to do is, since Cherry basically cornered the market on keyboards, they decided to make clones. And instead of trying to reinvent the schemes, uh, they basically said, okay, you know what, Cherry MX Red is a linear switch. Uh, well, our switch is also gonna be called Red, and it's linear, guess what, but we'll call it a gator on red because that's our company, right? And it allows people to standardize what they believe is their personal favorite feel around a color instead of a company and their models, which is actually really important. Um, and really the difference is, uh, you'd be surprised, a lot of the clones out there aren't necessarily inferior to Cherry, they're just different. Uh, I can't speak for Kales because I've never tried them, but Gatorons, some people say, actually feel better than Cherries, and because of their clear top, they're actually more useful in certain applications, which I'll go into later. So here's a couple common keyboards that you might see on a typical desk. You got your Razer gaming keyboards, uh, you got your Corsairs, DOS keyboard for people that are a little bit more civilized, um, and happy hacking keyboards for everyone else that doesn't actually like all those blinky LEDs and things. Um, so that's kind of what you see. But let me explain to you why any of these keyboards is better than a rubber dome. So you've heard people kind of, you know, talk trash about rubber domes. There is a very specific reason why no one wants them, and this is why. That right there, that piece of rubber or silicone or whatever, is the thing that replaces that switch and linear slider. That is terrible for a bunch of reasons, and I'll go into those right now. So number one, actuation feel. That's what most people care about when they're buying a mechanical keyboard. They want something that feels really great because you're gonna be using it for hours and hours sometimes, you know, every single day. And so you want it to feel really good, and most mechanical keyboards will, will offer that for a very long time. Mechanical keyboards also last a hell of a lot longer than rubber dome switches. Not just in the lifetime that's rated, 50 million keystrokes versus around five to 10, but they will feel better for that duration because at around five million keystrokes, that keyboard, that rubber dome thing is gonna turn to mush. It's gonna feel absolutely god awful. And the rubber domes, eh, no, not, not so good. But the mechanical switches will feel pretty much the same. Maybe a little scratchier, but you can lubricate that out. The other thing about mechanical switches that people love is that you can get, like I said, all the different feel types. Rubber domes are basically the same. They kind of have like a little bump and then they come up and that's it. But with mechanical switches, you've got so many. You have the red, the blues, and the browns, right? But there's so many different variants of that too, like greens, which are stiffer blues. And there's all these different types, right, that you can buy uh, if you know where to look. Um, they're also much easier for us to make mechanical keyboards Hard. You don't have to deal with any of this like building a membrane and like maybe making a silicone mold or something and all that. Each switch is independently contained and can be surfaced or it can be soldered directly to a circuit board uh, through hole style and you don't need any support material or anything like that. 
Um, the other reason why people love mechanical switches is because they are standardized. And what about them is standardized? Um, you'd be surprised. Uh, it's actually not the switch themselves. It's not the colors, although those are kind of standardized. There are some exceptions. It is the stems. That is what people want to be standardized. And I'll go into why in a second. So keyboard modding subculture is something that's really important today. And the keyboard that I made is kind of the farthest like reaches of that. But a little bit more mainstream for people that just have a regular mechanical keyboard and want to get into this, it's actually really easy to start out. So the very, the very first and most common thing you can do to your keyboard is a custom keycap mod. So generally, the reason why this works at all is because every single Cherry MX uh, switch or its clone will have the same plus looking stem. And what that means is that people that are making these custom keycaps can make all of them, all of them for one specific type of switch and it should work for most switches, uh, even the clones. Uh, there's two different ways of doing this. You can either buy a full set of keycaps that are custom made or you can buy individual artisan keycaps that can be made with a whole host of different methods. Um, for the full sets though, generally, there's two different types. There's double shot or die sublimation. Those are both generally the highest quality version that you can buy. Double shot for two color, die sublimation uh, for multiple. So let's look at a couple of examples. <laughs> so this is a really great example of how you can use artisan keycaps to kind of put a little bit of of your own flair to when, uh, what is an otherwise standard Corsair K70 keyboard. Uh, these keys also, you should note, are not made with double shot or die sublimation techniques. They were probably, you know, cast in some way. So artisan keycaps, you can go crazy with those and you can make them in a variety of different ways. This next keyboard is very nice, very pleasing to the eye. It is a full set keyboard, a keycap set. So this is something that you would buy if you want to bling out your entire keyboard all at once with something that a designer you know, spend a lot of time to make to make the whole keyboard look a certain way. Um, this next keyboard is kind of a hybrid of the two. It is a full full set called a GMK Mint, but it has this little tasteful skull reaper thing in the corner that fits the color scheme. Probably not from the same person, but it fits and it makes it look really nice. So let's see. This is kind of just an assortment of different things you can do. That makes it look like one of the um, the later generation Model M's if you're into that. Um, and then a, you know a few other different designs. This one's pretty cool because there's no um, there's no legend on the keys. People do that a lot, um, and it's it's just something you do for keyboards, especially those that are reprogrammable, so you don't get kind of stuck in one specific set. Uh, let's see. Okay, so the last thing really that people do with their keyboards, and this is the, by far the least done, is switch mods. So basically, let's say you buy a keyboard and you bought it for cheap and it has all brown switches, and you're like me, and you're like, oh, these are disgusting, right? Why, right? So what you can do is, first of all, you can replace the springs, and what that'll do is it'll change the actuation force. So let's say you want your keys to be a little bit harder to press, or a little bit easier to press, or whatever you want. You can replace just the springs, you can take them apart and just replace the springs, and you'll get a very different feel from the same keyboard. Um, what you can also do is put little O-rings, you can kind of see in this picture, uh, inside of the keycaps, and what that'll do is two things. One it'll make your keyboard a lot quieter by removing some of that bottoming out sound that you get when you press down the keys. The other thing that it'll do is it'll give you um, a shorter actuation distance. So it'll make typing a little bit faster. Um, the second, or the third thing you can do is lubrication. And I've actually tried this with m mixed results, um, but some people swear by it. Basically what you do is the, um, on the guide rails for a specific switch, you'll put a little bit of lubricant with varying levels of viscosity. And what that'll do is it'll completely change, sometimes, the typing experience for that switch, even if you've done nothing else to it. Um, this works especially well on older keyboards that may have had a little bit of um, a little bit of degradation over time. It might bring them back to life. I tried some of it with one of the Model M keyboard keys, and it didn't work out so well. Um, I don't know why, but you know, it's not for everybody, and it doesn't always work the way that you want it to. So, uh, caution there. Um, Last thing is uh, full switch desoldering and replacement. This is by far the most hardcore thing you can do uh, as a mod. And basically, you can change the switch types for certain keys depending on what you like. So for example, if you want your space bar to be a green when all the other ones are blues, just so you get that stiffer feel, you can go ahead and do that. You can either replace the entire key, or you can take out basically most of what makes the key a key and, and do it that way. Um, so that's, that's another thing. So now that we kind of have an idea of all the different types of switch mods that are, or all the different keyboard mods that exist, 
Now we're going to talk about the thing that we haven't done yet, which is what happens if I don't want to mod my keyboard, I want to build one from scratch. Okay. So first thing you've got to understand, mechanical keyboards do have standard sizes. Now you don't have to follow these standard sizes, but they do exist. So 100% think IBM Model M, think anything that basically has a numpad. Okay, that is a full-size keyboard, 100%. They actually generally have like 101 keys or somewhere around there, depending on modifier and media keys and things like that. Um, but that's generally 100%. Followed by the 10 keyless, and it is literally as simple as it sounds. It's a regular keyboard without the numpad or the 10 keys. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Sometimes they'll also be called 87 or 80% keyboards, just to keep with the theme of percentages. 60% uh, keyboards, which are by and far the most common keyboards that you can buy uh, for mechanical or as a mechanical keyboard. Uh, they don't have the function keys or the arrow keys. They're kind of a, a more purist approach to a keyboard. And a few people, a lot of people have these. Um, and if you know someone that has these, odds are uh, they kind of know what they're doing in the mechanical keyboard space and they're, they're a little, their taste is a bit more uh, refined. Um, and then for the crazy people, um, there is the 40%. And I love these keyboards because they are the simplest, uh, most intricate, I guess, you, you, it's intricate in a way because you, it's not just these keys. The keys you see aren't the only ones that are there. There's layers and layers of different key bindings and things that you can do to these to eke out a lot of functionality out of a relatively small amount of keys. There's only 40 or so keys on a 40% keyboard. Um, so if you see someone using these, ask them about it because they're probably really into mechanical keyboards. Um, yeah. So now we're going to talk about my keyboard. So yay. Um, so this it's called the Dark Matter Mechanical Keyboard. And I made it for my company, Adam Computer. Um, but it's really a company of one, so it's just me. Um, and we're going to talk about how to get from an idea in your head to something like this. Right? And this was actually one that I made um, in a batch of 15 for a few beta testers. Um, and they're still getting back to me with their feedback. And this uh, specific version doesn't have any legends on the keys. If you notice, it's, it's different than mine. All the keys are translucent. They look really nice with the rainbow effect and all that. Uh, so let's jump into it. First things first, you want to build a keyboard, you need your concept. There are so, so many different ways that you can go with this. You can build a regular 40%, 60%, 100%. You can do whatever you want. You can make a weird like three-dimensional sphere if you wanted to out of mechanical keys. And some people have done stuff like that. First of all, though, you need to think about ergonomics. Okay, How do you want the keyboard to feel to you? Do a bunch of research into the ergonomic designs that exist out there, and maybe try out some that aren't super conventional. Um, and I'll explain how I got to the design that I did in a minute. Uh, second thing is um, programmable, right? I wanted my keyboard to be programmable because I knew that in the beginning I wanted it to be lightweight, have very few keys, and kind of be this, this you know, very pared down version hardware-wise of what a keyboard could be. So it definitely needs to be programmable and have a bunch of different layers so I could like switch in and out and like have all the keys I don't normally use there. Um, lastly, for me, because I actually do, you know, as my hobby, I, I restore vintage computers. To me, something that's very important is durability and longevity, right? Because, you know, I owe it to the, the people that built these computers, you know, 30 years ago. The fact that they still work now is incredible. I mean, imagine if an iPhone worked 30 years from now. Yeah, right. Um, so it needs to be, it needs to be something that will last as long as possible. And I need to kind of contribute mentally to that effort in any way that I can. Um, and I'll explain how I did that also. Uh, the last thing is uh, the programmable layers uh, need to be in a, in, a, in a version, in a thing I eventually called plane switching, and I'll get into that too. But think about layering when you're building your keyboard. Do you want all of the keys on your keyboard to be what they are uh, you know, on the legend, right? Or do you want to have different layers that can do different things? You need to think about that. And finally, because I love LEDs, and I once made an LED bow tie, which was a really fun project, uh, I needed it to be backlight, backlit. And not just backlit, I needed, it to, I needed it to be RGB backlit, because colors. Um, so let's get into a little bit of this. So ergonomics. First things first, I did a bunch of research on this. Uh, I'm not going to get to go into all of it, because I don't have very much time. But I ended up going with something called staggered columnar spacing. And what that means is, if you notice, the keys on this aren't like these, where everything is row shifted, 
right? Uh, they're actually all linear in terms of the way that your fingers move. And that's actually really important because when your fingers are moving for long periods of time, you don't want them to make funny contorted shapes. Even if you're a touch typist, you have to admit, that's kind of what happens. You're just good at it, right? Um, it's not a perfectly ortholinear design, which means it's not like a grid of, 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 uh, of keys. Each column is shifted to align to the curvature of your finger, or the, 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 the height of your fingers, so that they're easier to, to type on and you don't have to kind of still do that. Um, and yeah, it's just generally better for finger movement. The other thing that was important about it, though, is that I wanted it to be split. And not just split like this one where it's kind of tilted. I, want, I wanted them to be completely independent of each other. Uh, and the reason why, it, well, there's a few reasons why. First of all, it's infinitely customizable. I can adjust it in any way that I wanted to. If I'm doing homework, I can put a piece of paper between these or I can put my laptop between it. I can do whatever I want. I can tilt them at any angle that I feel comfortable with at the moment. Um, so it just gives you a lot of freedom and you're not bogged down with a very specific, you know, a specific design forever. Um, it's also cheaper to buy individual circuit boards because they are smaller and price goes up exponentially as your board gets larger. So keep that in mind. All right. So I'm going to digress a little bit here because I kind of have to. I feel it's my duty. Why does staggered rows still exist if this super amazing staggered columnar system or any other system exists today? And the answer is surprisingly stupid. That. That's the reason. That's the only reason. It is momentum. Came out that way because they wanted things to be easier on the mechanical actuators for the typewriter. And so they set it up that way. And because no one wanted to change the electric typewriter, when the electric typewriter got ported to keyboards for computers, they left it alone. And no one types like this. No one types sideways the way that this is supposed to work. And so we created this weird touch typing system. And the reason no one changes it now is because everyone's a good, or whoever's a good touch typist would have to relearn an entirely new way of basically living sometimes, if that's what you do as your job. So a lot of, so this is basically kind of what it is still. And if we can change it, that's really good because this is terrible for ergonomics. This is really bad for your fingers. So let's work on that. So RGB backlighting. I use the extremely ubiquitous WS2812B LEDs, otherwise known as NeoPixels by Adafruit. Um, the reason why is because, for starters, I'm using a TNC-LC. Amazing board, so many pins, I'm using almost all of them. So I needed something that I could have one pin for the entire data input, and that's what this gives me. They're also extremely bright for their, uh, for their size. They're really tiny. That is less than half brightness. I think that's less than a third, actually, and you can probably see it from at the back of the room. If I turn them super bright, you barely couldn't even use them. Um, they also have an extremely good library uh, that Adafruit put out for them, so they're really great to work with, um, and also very good documentation. Uh, the reason why they're placed behind the key or the keys in a column is because, first of all, when you're looking at it from the front, you don't want to get blinded if they're in between the keys. And if you look at this thing straight on, you'll notice you can see the lights, right? And the reason why that is is because you can't actually put anything underneath these things. You have to actually put them behind them. There's no space underneath the switches to do this. So if you're going to design something like this and you want RGB backlight, you either have to put something inside the switch or behind it like I did so that you can't see them when you're normally typing on it. But if you look over them, you can definitely see it. Um, the other reason why these lights are very important is because they help you figure out what layer you're on. So if I go over here and I want to switch into a different layer, oh, well, look at that. I definitely know I'm in a different layer, net layer now, right? So, and then you can go through all the different layers and it'll tell you where you're at so you can find visually where you are in the keyboard. And that's very important to figure out where you are. Um, so next up, PCB design. Very important for someone that is interested in longevity and durability, right? So first things first, minimum number of components. Always super important. Limit your error with this. It's the easiest way to do so. So this keyboard has no diodes. Everything is directly inputted dir into, the, uh, into the microcontroller. And I can do this because there's two of them because it's split. 20 switches, 14 LEDs, six capacitors, one microcontroller, that's it. No other unnecessary superf superfluous components, minimal room for error. Now here's the thing. You might be thinking to yourself, okay, well what if the microcontroller fails? Well that's generally happens, right? Well, for starters, PGRC did a great job, and the TNC-LCs are basically indestructible. So that's, that's you know, they've got that going for them. Um, but second, if something should happen to it, guess what? Just socket it and put it somewhere easily accessible so you can throw one out, pay 10 bucks, flash it, stick it back in, and you're good to go for another 30 years, okay? That's basically all that, that's basically all that can break on this keyboard. So that was very important to put that in a very good location so that it can be removed. 
Um, I decided to go with Gatoron Blue Switches, not Cherry. And the reason why is because, first of all, blues are my favorites, and I love those, and they're so clicky, and oh my god, just go over here and you're just like, oh, oh, sounds great. Um, and they feel really good too. But they're also very LED friendly because the tops are all transparent and they diffuse the light very well, and that's how you can kind of get that good effect. Otherwise, it would look kind of funky. Um, PCB itself was designed in KiCad. If you don't know how to do circuit design, there are so many tutorials for this program. Learn them. This is a great open source program for making circuit boards, and it'll do anything that you want it to. It's a little weird, but once you figure out its quirks, it's really useful. Um, next up, case design. So originally I was thinking, okay, we're gonna have to go crazy, we're gonna have to 3D print something, we're gonna have to, you know, blah, 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 blah. no, forget that. We're gonna go even simpler, sandwich design. We're gonna create a circuit board that's so beautiful, you can use it as the top layer, you won't need to hide it, okay? So we did that, all right? Next up, you need to make a spacer plate to put underneath the pins so that the pins don't jam into the base plate and cause a havoc. And then you need to build a base plate, and that's it, okay? Robust, easy, eighth inch acrylic sheet, super ubiquitous, you can laser cut it on just about anything, right? Uh, and it's super easy to customize. If you have the vector, fi the vector files, you can make this out of anything, or make it on anything. CNC machine, water jet, laser cutter, anything. And you can make it out of any material too. Uh, carbon fiber, aluminum, plastic, wood, anything. Um, the other thing that I actually am very proud of this, uh, this keyboard is the way that it's held together, because the four mounting bolts that actually hold everything together also act as the mounts for the rubber feet. So there is literally no wasted componentry on here. There's no adhesive pads that go separate from everything else. Everything is just all bundled into one. And as you can see from the base here, super clean, four holes, everything's mounted. Um, how many times have you bought something that's like super old or like an old piece of computer history and those little rubber mounts that are just like glued on fell off like eons ago? That sucks, right? Yeah, it sucks. But this time, if it did fall off somehow, you can put it on, put on a new one. It's, it's bolt on. All right. So, now we're getting into the build aspect of things. So, first things first, you need to source those PCBs that you just built in KiCad. You can go to Osh Park, which is really great for those purple and gold PCBs. Um, in order quantities about one to three, they're really great. If you need more, or you want different colors, Seed Studio is a really great place to go to. Super fast turnaround, um, their shipping is reasonable, and their, their pricing is actually getting better, which doesn't normally happen, but it is. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, microcontroller, PGRC, TNCLC. Reason why I went with this is because it's the same for form factor as the 3.1. It's just much cheaper, um, and it's still super rock solid, and I love those things so much. I've had so many uh, boards die on me, but these ones just keep on trucking. Switches, Gatoron Blues. Switches are generally hard to find, especially if they're cherry. Um, I would recommend, if you're going to build one or two keyboards, go on eBay and try and find somebody that sells them. Otherwise, it's going to be really hard to source them directly. Um, so do that. Um, keycaps and LEDs, a little bit different. So the, you can find NeoPixels just about anywhere. You can buy them from Adafruit's website. You can buy them from Alibaba and Reels directly from the manufacturer if you want. Um, but just find them at your favorite, you know, favorite place. I will note this, though. Something that really screwed me up when I was building my beta run, they don't document this anywhere but you cannot use a different voltage for the data pin as you do for the power pin. It will screw them up, and they will just flicker or die and not work at all, and you'll be frustrated out of your mind for months. <laughs> it happened to me. Um, I had to find that information from the deepest, darkest recesses of the internet, and it sucked. And I'm like, oh, well, that was it? Oh, three volts to five volts, that's the difference? That's what really screwed me up? Okay, well, that sucks. So yeah, just, just note. Um, and then keycaps, you can buy them just about anywhere. And the thing about these is that you can buy the cheapest $10 set, you, you know, from Alibaba or AliExpress, or you can buy like the chocolatier special edition or whatever that they have on uh, vintage computer forums for like 300 bucks. So it's really a large spectrum from, you know, area end to end. Um, plates, like I mentioned, build the Illustrator file. The way that I, I located everything was I actually imported the file that, that I made in KiCad as a PDF, or no, as a SVG and I located the, the holes that way, so they were perfect. Um, and I also did something kind of interesting, too. If you'll notice, the, the spacer plate is smaller than the board, and the base plate is larger than the board. And what this does is it makes this cool floating effect, so it looks like the PCB is floating over the base plate. Um, at least I like to think that it looks that way. I think it looks pretty cool. Um, laser cut eighth inch equivalent, like I mentioned. Uh, they were all laser cut uh, in San Diego by a local machine shop maker place. Um, and you just peel off the plastic or paper or whatever you're making out of, and you're good to go. Uh, let's see. Final assembly. So most of you know how this works, right? First thing you do, you solder on the, you spray the solder paste. Um, eventually, I had to do it with a syringe. It sucked. Then I've got a stencil. Much nicer. Um, people say that you can't SMD solder with a heat gun. Don't listen to those people. You can. And people say that NeoPixels melt. They do. But you just have to be good. 
and it works, right? You can totally, you can totally solder NeoPixels with a heat gun. It works, I've done it a lot. Um, eventually, I've, I've moved over to a toaster oven. It is not regulated in any way. It is just a regular toaster oven, but it works wonders if you get the timing right. You might lose a couple boards in the testing process, but once you get it down, it's pretty consistent. Uh, then you just do, you know, you, you solder the switches in. Since they're PCB mount, they have these little plastic bits that are very hard to press in, and you have to really jam them in there, and then they won't move forever, so it's awesome. You just solder, through hole solder that, and you're done. Then you do the pins or the TNCLC socket, pretty straightforward. Uh, you do the sandwich, like I mentioned, you bolt everything together, and you're good to go. Lastly, you put your TNCLC in, put your nice custom keycaps in, and you're all set. And if you did all of that, now, you're ready for the hard part, um, the software. So originally somebody asked me, okay, so what kind of software did you use? Did you go use this or this? And there's a few different options online. And those are all for those standard sizes of keyboards I was telling you about. When you're building something like this where there's really no layout that fits it quite right, you have to do everything from scratch. The first version that I had, I'll, I'll let you read this, but I don't want to go too much into it. Basically, it was a super bare bones something or other that I made um, in the Arduino IDE. It couldn't be programmed. All the LEDs and stuff were hard-coded. It was, it was kind of terrible, but it worked, and I was very happy with that. So everything worked out. It tested everything. But then I realized, okay, we need to overhaul this completely because it missed out on my number one thing, which was programmability, right? I want to be able to adjust what's on these layers and what colors those layers are on the fly. So we're going to get to software v2. So this is a two-part thing. First of all, you need a GUI interface on your computer that allows you to input all the stuff you want your keyboard to now do. And secondly, you need something, an advanced firmware, that will be able to interpret this data and actually apply it consistently. So let me talk a little bit about the Alchemy Keybinding Editor. I actually came to Hackaday with this keyboard last year without the Alchemy Editor, and it was a completely different device. It was all hard-coded, it was basically just a fancy keyboard. Now, it is much more interesting because you can do so much more with it. So, first of all, it was made in Microsoft Visual Studio, uh, which is really good for really basic GUI stuff if you're gonna do that. And for some reason, Microsoft doesn't actually give you a way to pull through all of your different COM ports and see what's where. So you have to make that logic and stuff yourself. And it was a lot of trial and error, and eventually I got that going. And it also has side detection, so it can detect which side is left and right, which COM port those are assigned to. And that actually took kind of the longest amount of time to get that figured out. Um, then it basically just compiles and sends the data over serial. It takes all of the, uh, all the keys like E, whatever, whatever characters you want those keys to do, converts them to a byte on the ASCII table and sends them over. And you might be asking yourself, okay, well, what about like left control? Does that have an ASCII, you know, thing? Well, no, it doesn't. But there's a ton of stuff you don't type on the ASCII chart. So if you want to send that data over, it's still in bytes. You just take control, make it like 253 or whatever on the ASCII table, have it send that as whatever byte it is over serial, and then have the keyboard decode it. Because you know, obviously, you control end to end, so you know what it's going to be, and you can decode it pretty easily. Uh, the firmware, basically kind of a mirror of this. It accepts those serial key bindings. Uh, it decodes all the modifier keys and saves those as whatever byte um, that they were supposed to be onto the keyboard. The keyboard is also responsible for re, uh, for changing up what the different, or for interpreting what is color data and what is light or uh, key binding data and split those up. Everything is saved in EEPROM. Unfortunately, the LCs, their main drawback is they only have like 128, uh, 128 bytes total. Um, so it really limits what you can do with them. And actually, the reason why there's only five layers on these things is because it ran out of space in EEPROM, so you can't really do much more than that. Um, but because everything's saved on the EEPROM, you can take this to any computer. It'll still have the same lights. It'll still have the same key bindings. It'll still have everything. Um, and yeah, so that, that's that. And if you do all, or actually here. So this is kind of what the Alchemy Editor looks like as of right now. There's a bunch of drop-down menus for all the different uh, keys. Um, it lets you do the default layout if you just want QWERTY, uh, clear all the layouts. Uh, connect to the keyboard, and then import the key bindings that are currently on the keyboard, which is one of the last fun functions that we did, um, and then upload any changes. Set backlight color actually gets you to a color picker, which is pretty cool, because you can actually find in hex code what you want your keys to be, and it's kind of like next level, like, oh, I want it to match my walls. Like, you can find the hex code for your walls and just, you know, do that, it's pretty cool. Um, it also allows for special modes, which was kind of like what I was showing you. There's a few of them, but this is my favorite. It's, oh, not this one, this one. Uh, pulsing rainbow. Uh, while you can still type, and while it's still very, uh, very fast. So I don't actually know, 
it, it took a long time to get that going, but finally I found something that works, and I was very happy with it, and you can still type super fast. I think it has like beyond, like end key rollover, I think is what they call it, where basically you can press as many keys as you want, and it'll, it'll actually acknowledge all of them. So if you press all 10 fingers at once, it will press all 10 of them and type all 10 of them, um, even while that's going, so that's pretty cool. Um, and if you do all that and you get your software good and you know get everything good to go, you'll end up with this. If it loads, will load. Yes, hey, woo, super rainbow effect. Um, and you can type on it and do all kinds of stuff and blind, blind your friends and you know all that stuff. Um, so yeah, that is my presentation for the dark matter keyboard. This is a picture that I took, you know, with a setup that I had a while ago. You notice that's an old Hackaday. Uh, badge in the side. And um, yeah, thank you so much for coming.